what I like to do is collect, travel, go to small cities, small towns, small spaces, and find kind of this historic cut to America. Business of Architecture, episode 417. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that doesn't get in the way of you doing your best work more often. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Well, John, welcome to the business of architecture. All right, thank you for having me. So I want to go back into time from when you, there was this recession in the early 90s. And as far as I could tell, that's when you started your firm. Tell me about that process. What triggered that? What was that like? Sure. So uh, I graduated uh, New York Tech with a degree in architecture. I was working for a few architects in New York and um, I was ready to uh, break out um, out of the home life and see what California was like. My brother was out there. He was going to law school. So, uh, unfortunately, when I got to L.A. in 1990, there was a pretty heavy recession. So it took a few years to really get a job that was architectural related. Um, I did a series of um, drywall sales. I never even heard of what a track house was. And I learned all about track house in the desert. Um, I was doing drafting for architects, manual drafting for architects. I was basically doing anything I could to stay in the business or be in the business. Um, and then the 94 earthquake hit, and that helped uh, get a professional job with an insurance restoration company. I was an expert witness for them. That was working out really well. And then um, uh, my boss asked me you know, what my goals were, and uh, my goals didn't align with where he was seeing me in his company. So uh, that, that was when I broke out on my own and started building. Gotcha. And what were the goals that you had at that time that your, uh, your employer didn't necessarily <laughs> It was a support. very specific goal. He asked me, uh, he said, oh, you're doing great here. You're young. You're doing great. You're, you're, you're really developing in here. And uh, he goes, what's your goal? And I said, well, my goal is to make 400000 a year. And he immediately said, well, he almost laughed. Well, he did laugh and said, well, you're not going to do that here. And then I laughed. I said, well, all right, uh, this is my two weeks notice. And I realized I didn't want one more second to be spent against something I couldn't achieve based on someone else's uh, will. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so that was the goal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great anecdote. So great. So you went from this position that was probably fairly stable and now you gave your two weeks right. notice. Um, what kind of thoughts and, and maybe fears did you have or misgivings about, hey, you're, you're out there without a position yeah, now? Um, when I started Built, I was uh, doing some like small design build remodels. I think my first project was two bathrooms in um, this couple's home. And uh, I hired a, a superintendent and he had a lot of experience and uh, I designed the bathrooms for them. I settled on a price with the clients of $12,000 to renovate two bathrooms. And my superintendent helped me do the budget. And the first subcontract that came in was the plumber. And this is after I had the contract signed. And the plumber said, yeah, this is a great project. I'll do it for twelve grand." And he meant just the plumbing part. Uh, I looked at the superintendent and I was like, oh my God, what happened? And he just shrugged his shoulders. So that was my first lesson in uh, not trusting anyone else. Even though he you know, had years of experience over me, I just realized that uh, I just have to trust myself and do all the research and do it myself. So uh, that kind of led me to one of my first full um, home, uh, uh, new homes that we were building. And um, the client asked, have I ever built a new home? And I was like, oh, of course I have. Okay, of course I have. Of course I have. And I never did. And it was uh, a set of plans from a design arc, very um, high-end architectural firm in LA. And uh, that's where I really focused on um, studying the job site every day and asking myself, what didn't I know? What was going on that I was missing? So I was really my, my biggest critic and my biggest, uh, you know, um, I was supervising myself. So I uh, used the initial 
failure of these two bathrooms as look you're gonna have to teach yourself how to do this um you know and and i accepted this uh this house and it was a very difficult house to build it wasn't large it was about 2200 square feet but it was the perfect project for us yeah so how did the bathroom project work out how'd you pull out of that one <laughs> um it worked out well they they were uh i didn't give them a change order i somehow you know pulled the money together and <laughs> produced two bathrooms for them. And uh, I wound up doing a second phase for them. And actually that project got us one of our first um, uh, design build, bigger design build projects. It was uh, a 700 square foot house in Studio City. The house was built in the early 20s by a demo contractor. And um, the clients wanted to add another 550 square feet. So uh, at the time, I was studying the book, A Pattern Language, and I used that book and its um, method methodology um, to really study every single element of the, of, of the project, meaning um, I studied why is a wall a wall, why is a floor a floor, why is a window a window, and uh, I took a, a new approach to each and every part of that, and I, and I used that first real project uh, to uh, challenge myself to do something that's all on my own and unique. Um, that project managed to get us into the uh, LA Times when the newspaper was really flowing and uh, that project threw off um, 10 years of uh, potential projects. I would go to people's homes and they would see the article written about me and um, you know, even 10 years later people would say, wow, I've just been, the article is really well written, I really put my soul into the project and uh, uh, that really started uh, our, our, project, our company. Okay. So you, you've been doing design build from the very start, it sounds like. What is your opinion on design only in terms of a business model? Obviously, you haven't chosen that route. What would it be like for you if we just took away the build part from you? Sure. We um, wind up getting into that every once in a while. We we are doing projects around the country. And uh, a project in Chicago was where we were the designers as a hotel. And they hired a local large contracting firm. And... All we found was a lot of difficulty in getting our design executed the way we intended it. No matter how many drawings we did, no how many meetings we had, no matter how much job site supervision that we provided, uh, the contractor was just, you know, flattening out our design is the way I would uh, describe it. And we managed to salvage the design and uh, we came in with the uh, furniture fixtures and equipment at the end and really gave the space uh, a soul with its decor. But it was a frustrating pro process because it was just as easy to do it right as to do it wrong. And it was just, you know, one superintendent handing it off to another foreman and that foreman talking to a super uh, uh, subcontractor. And by the time the work actually got done, it was uh, flattened out is the, is the way I would describe it. Yeah. And now to, to maintain that artistic control when you're doing jobs in other parts of the country, how do you manage that? Do you have your own team that you fly out there to make sure they know the design intent? How does that work? So uh, I'm actually in Atlanta right now. We're opening a nightclub in a week. Um, so uh, with the lesson of the Chicago project, I dedicated to come to the job site every two weeks and uh, we did it for, as a regular uh, thing. And we were lucky that the owner has, uh, the client has a, a friend who's a contractor that they've been doing work with uh, together, built the developing homes. And he's never developed, done a nightclub. So he was um, an experienced contractor, but he deferred to me on all, ba on all basis. So it was more of a design build process because, uh, you know, they wouldn't make a move without me. And um, a lot of design build process that I do, you know, is uh, decisions made in the field as we go step by step, layer by layer, as opposed to developing a set of plans that, um, you know, were developed a year before the project. Um, so we're really able to add that soul to the project as we do on all of our projects that we're building ourselves because we had a lot of control over the project. So with the hotel project, we're about to do the San Francisco one, and we're going to be able to command a lot more control over it based on how the, the uh, Chicago project went. Uh, for that same hotel, we did a Boston project and that contract was very uh, in tune with what I was doing and that worked out well. So I really think it's it's the team and, and who's on the team and, and, and how they're um, respecting you know the other team players. Got it. Now you started out, got your foot in the the early days in the residential design, which is a less higher, lower barrier of entry, and you've transitioned now to where you're doing a lot of hospitality projects, nightclubs, hotels. How did you make that transition, John? 
So we did about 500 residential remodels or new homes over the years. And in 2006, I had a, a handful of night, uh, restaurants that I've done. And um, one of my draftsmen had a side project, which was a potential, which, which was a nightclub. And he came to me and he said, look, this project is just about to get um, uh, approved by the planning department. Can you take a look at it? And it was basically a rectangular box. It was a new building. And um, the client came and looked at one of my projects on, in, uh, uh, on Wilshire Boulevard on the east side near downtown L.A. Uh, he came in for two minutes. He's like, okay, that's fine. Let's go. Let's start this. So um, he gave me the opportunity to do the project. It was funny because um, I used my experience in going to nightclubs over in the 80s and, uh, as my design of this nightclub. And I was totally off base. I was, it was ridiculous. They, had, they were like, what is this? I'm like, oh, this is going to be a great nightclub. There's all these nooks and crannies. People can get together and kind of uh, – they're like, no, this is bottle service. Everyone has to have the same exact booth, so it's, it's, uh, no one has a hierarchy over anyone. And uh, like, while I've heard of what bottle service was, I've never experienced it and I really know what it was. So it was a kind of a funny um, moment because I kind of built the booths out and in just like a light plywood. And I was like very I was excited to show them the layout within this space. And they were like, oh my God, what is going on here? So they, my clients taught me what a nightclub, uh, you know, how a nightclub works. And uh, that was called Guy's Bar. That building I built. It was about a 4,500 square foot building. Um, I did Guy's Bar inside the, in, in the space and um, we've done six uh, total projects in that building for different clients. So the clients would um, sell the project then I'd come along with the building or the project. So we did Guy's Bar, we did uh, um, uh, the Beverly, uh, we did uh, Hooray Henry's, Henry's, uh, now we did the Peppermint Club. I think there's another one in there. So we've mount, managed to do six projects within, within a building that I built. Uh, and I kind of describe it as my own ATM machine. <laughs> so I take it that now you're making more than 400000 a year? <laughs> uh, we're trying to, yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been, it's been good. We uh, usually run about 50 projects at a time in any one stage from design to finish out. Um, the nightclub that we're opening soon in uh, Atlanta has three venues in a row uh, attached to each other. So while we're finishing one, we're starting, we've already started the second one and we've done plans and we're permitting on the third one. The project we're doing here is called Ravine. They're spending a lot of money on lighting and sound, which is great. And it's going to have some really high end DJs and it's going to be a, a, a hit. It's going to hold about 2,500 people. We actually shipped all of the uh, booths and um, furniture and plants and bottle service tables from LA and we f flew in last night to set the room up. So we have about three um, tr trucks coming. We've got one today and then two more tomorrow. Nice. So was was this transfer into uh, hospitality? Was it in something intentional that you did from the beginning or did you fall into it and said, hey, this is a great niche. Let's go for it. What's funny is the, one of my first commercial projects was a boxing gym and it was so stressful about um, uh, schedule that I was like, I'm staying away from commercial and that's why I really focused on residential. It was easier. The, the time frame was, was, was not strict. But then once I got back into um, that club, I, I realized a couple of things. One, the time frame is actually your friend. It pushes the project. It gets it done fast. So the cash flow is there. The uh, the, the the number of product you know, the product doesn't last for eighteen months or twenty four months. It's seven, eight, nine months, and you're open from you know meeting the client to opening. The um, other part that I realized, and, and I didn't really f understand it until. Uh, a couple of nightclubs that I've done. One of my uh, assistants was at the club and she just got hired and she's looking around and she's smiling and she's like, oh my God, look what you're doing. And I go, what? She goes, look how happy everybody is. You're making everyone happy. And that's when I realized um, how many people come to a creation of ours and how they, how many more people can experience, uh, uh, you know, our work. So um, from that point of view, I think that really motivated me to really focus on hospitality and and uh, fade out of the residential market right now we are we finished um a high-end uh residence and we're doing one other one in the in the hamptons but um those are like very special projects that we're doing now um, otherwise nightclub restaurant nightclub restaurant 
Gotcha. I took a look at some of your projects, very, um, shall we say, luxurious looking interiors, uh, you know, a bit of um, ornament, rich colors, um, interesting use of lights and uh, different focal points of interest. Well, tell me your, your design inspiration. I'd have to say it's pretty unique. You know, what do you draw upon to come up with your own unique design language? Sure. So I'm, I've studied the case study program um, from the 50s and 60s, and I really focused a lot of my residential design on that. So then when I got into the hospitality uh, nightclub scene, I took a lot of that residential feel into the clubs. Uh, I try to actually stay out of nightclubs so I don't become, you know, inspired by someone else's work on that on that side. Uh, what I like to do is collect, travel, go to small cities, small towns, small spaces, and find kind of this historic cut to America. And uh, we collect a lot of objects and art from um, a different era. We stockpile it based on the projects that we're doing, and then we in, uh, implement those those items. Um, so I, I, I love the smaller, lower human scale of um, the more historic spaces. Awesome. And how do you find that you get your projects now? Right now, it's purely word of mouth. We don't use business cards anymore. It's just taking one client, handing us off to another, introducing us to another. Um, I think a lot of people are looking at the projects that we've done, and then they research who's actually done the design work, and then they come to us. And that's happening more and more. Awesome. So I heard about you, John, because I was reached out to by someone who's doing PR for you. I find that's interesting. Uh, how long have you invested in PR and, and what's your opinion on investing in PR? So we, this is our sixth PR firm. Um, they are great and uh, they are very in sync with um, one of our main clients, the H. Wood Group. They're their PR firm as well. So uh, I really believe in a couple of things about PR. One, we take a back seat to the opening of the of the venue. Uh, we want the club the club to um, live on its own and have its own explosion, and then we can come in on the design side uh, a month or so later and and let people know that we've designed it and and get the articles written about us on that side. Um, I think with a good PR firm with the right budget, uh, it's necessary to get out there. Uh, I think with but we've experienced a lot of um, you know not so good PR firms and um, they start off really great. And then it's just, you know, you're receiving the same, um, same summary every week. And you're just looking at the summary. It just looks like the same summary from last week. We've reached out, we've reached out, we've reached out. I think we've done enough work that it's not that hard to get articles written about us, uh, especially with the number of venues that we open a year. So uh, I think it's necessary. And, and if you don't have a PR firm, you should be doing PR in-house to, to some degree. And what does PR in-house look like? How would someone do that? I think the, the key to doing PR in-house is uh, studying what a PR firm actually does, right? Reaching out to authors and writers and editors and uh, announcing the work that you're doing. Clearly, you should be doing work that is PR worthy or, 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 or press worthy. And um, we do a large volume of work. I, you know, I think so, there's a there's a thing out there right now where if you do one project, you should be, you know, blasting it out there. And I've always thought, you know, as long as I keep doing work and doing a lot of work and doing a lot of good work, uh, I'll get noticed and the PR firm helps. I don't think it's the, it's the magic, uh, you know, potion to getting, to getting uh, up and out, out there. I think it's just one element that um, is necessary. Okay, awesome. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to 
smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.